Hello, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, with your thought for the day. I received an email the other day from an 87-year-old American listener of mine in America named Lillian, who pointed out something interesting. She was going through her old uh, shoeboxes, uh, recently clearing stuff out, and found her old Social Security card from the 1940s. And she pointed out that on that Social Security card, there's an interesting thing written at the bottom, specifically said not uh, for identity purposes. So this is the Social Security card that I'm sure most American citizens will be familiar with. This is from ssa.gov, and this is the standard type of card that's issued these days. And of course, uh, it's got all the Social Security information on the back. It's got the number and and uh, name and U.S. citizen or or whatever written on the front. But uh, I, I, I so I thought about that, and I went and I looked up, and you can find various examples of the old Social Security card numbers online. And here's one uh, that was actually Elvis Presley's from the 1950s. And sure enough, for Social Security purposes, not for identification, clearly written at the bottom. And it struck me when looking at this just how interesting it is. These tiny little details can sometimes say so much about where we are as a society and who we are as a people and the extent to which we have been programmed to accept things that were once thought unthinkable. Why not for identification? Why was that so brazenly uh, written right there on the front in big bold letters for uh, all those people in that first generation or two of uh, people who got these social security cards uh, in the first place? Why was that something that needed to be put up front and center and made uh, absolutely to everyone's attention is because, of course, that was an issue when Social Security first started in the 1930s. The first cards had big, big, uh, bold proclamations. This is not for identification because people were scared of the idea of federally mandated, federally issued identification that was going to be used to track and surveil people and uh, and basically put them into catalogs and databases that everyone at the time knew that was a sign of tyranny. That was something that Americans did not want in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And yet somehow we've arrived at this card where, of course, that's been effaced. So how and when and where did we get to that point? Well, as I'm sure I don't need to elaborate too much for most of the people in who do follow the alternative media, of course, we have been on this course of eroding uh, the, the sense of privacy and uh, privacy protection for decades if not uh, half a century or more at this point. And of course, it culminates in things like the Real ID Act. I'm sure that most of the old timers here, uh, by which I mean people who have been in this for at least a few years, who will probably be able to remember back to uh, Aaron Russo's 2006 documentary, Freedom to Fascism, where one of the major points that he was making was uh, the Real ID Act was coming. The Real ID Act was going to f- create a federally standardized uh, identification that was going to look like your local state drive driver's license, but it was actually going to be federally uh, run and federally issued, or at least federally standardized. And that was a big issue in Freedom to Fascism, and a lot of people were talking about that issue at the time. But then there was some kickback, and so, of course, there was some there was some holdouts, and then the, the bill got passed in 2005. It was signed into law by Bush, but it was eventually put sort of on the back burner, and there, w- there was some um, time limitation uh, extensions that were given and things like that. So So it basically faded away as a political issue. But guess what? While you were sleeping, in case you didn't know, back in December of 2013, Department of Homeland Security said, hey, guess what, guys? We're going to start enforcing that Real ID thing that we talked about years and years and years ago that you've all forgotten about. And as of January last year, 2014, they started actually implementing it. And you can go to dhs.gov and you can read about the Real ID uh, and how it's been standardized and what states issue it and what states still have extensions that are about to run out. And um, and all of that, again, this has all been going on while you were sleeping, the federally standardized uh, driver's licenses, which of course are not just federally standardized at this point. It's an intergovernmental cooperation in a worldwide implementation for worldwide globally standardized IDs that's been going on for a very long time now. I was, um, I posted a guest post up by Nathan Allenby back in 2010 on CorbettReport.com going into great detail about the various ways that this has been implemented and standardized behind the scenes by uh, intergovernmental agencies like the ICAO 
which have a standardized format for issuing this type of ID. Tons and tons of information in this article, and there's an interview with Nathan Allenby linked up there in that article. Uh, Of course, all of this will be in the show notes, so please do check out these links for more information. But there you go. It's a globally standardized ID that is gradually being implemented everywhere in the world, and uh, people still don't even know about their federally issued IDs. And then top that off with things like the driver's license for the internet that people like Craig Mund of uh, Microsoft were calling for back in 2009, 2010. Well, in 2011, Obama, the cyber president, uh, started the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace and released this white paper back in April 2011 talking about how the federal government was going to be spearheading and uh, and piloting various projects to create an ecosystem uh, uh, online for privacy identity identification and, and all of this that basically the federal government was going to be Getting in there, getting their hands dirty, trying to get people involved in uh, in ways of uh, verifying their online identity. But of course, the government wasn't going to be issuing these types of IDs. They're just they're just sponsoring it and, and getting. They're kind of coordinating the private industries that's going to, that's going to be implementing this. So as part of this uh, April 2011 white paper, it created a national program office under NIST. Yes, the same NIST that created World Trade Center uh, buildings 1, 2, and 7 whitewashes, that same NIST, is now coordinating the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, creating this uh, uh, ecosystem, the identity ecosystem, and paying millions upon millions of dollars in pilot projects to various companies to start creating cyber IDs that eventually are going to be your way of getting onto the internet. It is coming. An ID for the internet is coming, and it is being spearheaded right now by things like this National Program Office. Again, link in the show notes. Or if you don't believe it, it's that it's already happening. It is already being test piloted. As of April of last year, it was already being test piloted in uh, in two states, Michigan and Pennsylvania. Uh, again, being sponsored millions of dollars for the state governments to start uh, basically piloting these projects for, again, federally uh, standardized and, and coordinated cyber IDs. Um, so this is already happening. And if you think all of this isn't enough, it gets even more Buck Rogers science fiction-y. Uh, back in 2009, I wrote an article on the DNA control grid, and at that time, there was a quote-unquote revelation, uh, a, a mainstream news revelation. This isn't conspiracy theorizing. The Austin American statesman and others were reporting on a quote-unquote discovery that for 40-plus years, the state of Texas had been keeping the blood spots collected from babies at birth, keeping those uh, blood spots on record in a DNA database that they didn't let parents know about, but that they were using for scientific research purposes. Of course, scientific research purposes, right? The same way Japan uses uh, uh, the whales for scientific research purposes, and somehow those whales end up in school lunches, as I can po- uh, posit attest to in my own experience. So again, scientific research purposes, the uh, the government has been collecting babies' uh, bloods, blood at birth for 40 years and putting it into a secret DNA database that is controlled by the Pentagon as it comes out. And uh, it, uh, it's not just in Texas, for those uh, who, who think so. It's in the United States, it's in the UK, it's in Canada, it's in Australia. There was an article from The Age uh, out of Australia in 2004 that identified a specific com- company Genetic Health Services Victoria that had been hired by the state government of Victoria to store again this blood these blood samples taken from newborns uh, from 1965 onward again without the parents' knowledge or consent and internal documents obtained by the age of this Genetic Health Services Victoria this private company said that they believed that they owned. The, not only the cards themselves, but more importantly, the genetic information on the cards. This private company that no one has ever heard of because no one ever talked about it actually believes they own your baby's blood and genetic material for their secret DNA databases. Again, all of this information is now already six years old and it just gets even more ridiculous from there. Um, People who don't know about the various DNA databases that are being constructed in various countries, the UK is a particularly illustrative example. It's uh, been storing DNA database, uh, DNA information for years and years now, not only from criminal suspects or people who are actually on trial for something, but for people who are uh, detained for any reason whatsoever, even people who are not charged with a crime. 
There's been a back and forth for years and years in the UK court system and uh, UK parliament about this practice. There are hundreds and hundreds of links available for, uh, for example, at places like genewatch.org documenting this struggle um, that still continues. Uh, the, they, the UK police still connect, collect and, uh, and store DNA uh, information, but now they promise to destroy it within six months unless it's being used in an actual trial. And uh, don't worry, you can trust the, the UK government, of course, right? Uh, and again, that's just one example from one country. This is, this is a process that's going on in multiple countries. A uh, good article on this that I highlighted recently in the New World Next Week, How DNA is Turning Us into a Nation of Suspects, that goes through some of the different ways that DNA is collectible and collected and being used in various ways by various government agencies. It says, having already used surveillance technology to render the entire American populace potential suspects, DNA technology in the hands of government will complete our transition to a suspect society in which we all merely are all merely waiting to be matched up with a crime and it goes on to say if scientists can use it can using dna track salmon across hundreds of square miles of streams and rivers how easy will it be for government agents to not only know everywhere we've been and how long we were at each place but collect our easily shed dna and add it to the government's already burgeoning database this is buck rogers science fiction nightmarish stuff and for decades, for half a century, uh, for the, the last half a century anyway, people have intuitively known, felt in their bones that this is a absolute 100% in-your-face hallmark of tyranny. It was even put into literature and given a name by Orwell, uh, of course, uh, George Orwell, 1984, Big Brother is Watching You. This has been the symbol for decades and decades of governmental tyranny and a government run amok when these types of, uh, these these invasions of our basic privacies by government are uh, start to become widespread. People have known that is nightmare surveillance society stuff. And yet now when you Google image something like Big Brother, you're as equally likely to get, of course, the, the CBS uh, hit television show and pictures of scantily clad men and women because, again, everything is programming and they are trying to distract you from real issues that our grandparents knew, knew, and had to be reassured that this was not happening. We're not using this for any sort of federal identification. We're not tracking you. We're not surveilling you. We're not databasing you. Honest, you can trust us. Just accept this little number in your life and everything will be better. And a few decades later, this is what it becomes. This is the very image of government tyranny, and it is unfolding before our eyes and sometimes it's just the tiniest little detail that will reveal all of this to you. So, once again, I think even those of us who are vigilant and aware of these issues can be climatized, desensitized, programmed to simply accept that this is the way things are now nowadays and there's nothing that can be done about it. I don't think that is the case. If you don't think so, please please help spread this information to other people. All of the links to everything I've talked about here will be in the show notes for this video. Thank you for watching, and thank you as always to everyone who sends in tips and ideas like that. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, looking forward to talking to you again real soon.